talked a lot about Celtic identity and the unity of this union of Celtic culture from Spain to the Balkans. I have, for my part, a more restricted overview of the problem as I work on a more geographically restricted phenomenon, which is Latinian urbanization. The so-called Opida civilization corresponds to a large area from the ocean to Hungary. So, um, for, for my work, I don't, I don't take into account um, Spain, uh, Great Britain, and the eastern part of, uh, of Europe, uh, because uh, both chronology and settlement patterns uh, were a bit different there. Although inhabited uh, by many peoples, uh, each with their own authority, this vast continental region shared not only more important aspects of artistic expression and material culture, as the Nohan Fibula, for example, or the uh, Bratzlas, but they also seems to follow a common process of structuring the territory and of concentration of settlements, um, uh, which leads to the appearance of large agglomerations um, at the end of the Iron Age. The density of their population, the diversity of their functions, and their rule as centers for the surrounding area, let us consider certain of those settlements as real cities. Of course, uh, different rhythms and factors can be distinguished for each part of this large area, but all those regions uh, seem to follow a common frame. First, um, during the 3rd and 2nd century BC, uh, we have the appearance of open agglomeration that we often consider as uh, important craft and commercial centers. And then, from the end of the 2nd century BC, uh, the appearance of sites that were often fortified and uh, that we consider uh, also as political and religious centers. So, inside the so-called Celtic world, a large region seems to follow close processes. This phenomenon is only possible if uh, there were contacts, interactions, that linked all those regions together. Starting from this idea, I work at studying this long-debated urbanization process in the light of the idea of network. A city never exists alone. It's never just a dot in a map. Its own human character is not a fundamental feature of a site, but is inferred, um, but is inferred from the relationships, attractiveness, and polarization of spaces that surround <coughs> it. A city relies on an hinterland and is most often connected with other cities in what is called a human network. Besides, by definition, the city will be the place where all those relations, interactions, so in a word, networks, um, will articulate among themselves from the local to the intercultural level. Those relations consist in more or less intense contacts that connect settlements to each other. They could be of different nature, economic, political, or ideological and cultural. The progressive setting up of this interaction system was fundamental in the appearance of agglomerations and in the territorial structure. Um, during the 4th century uh, uh, BC, uh, the landscape uh, should have been composed of uh, uh, more or less extensive networks of farms. Whereas four centuries later, at the time of uh, Caesar's campaign in Gaul, uh, territories seemed to be much more structured and to involve a variety of much, much larger settlements. These changes had implication, uh, implications for the evolution of networks that connect them, including a multiplication of types of relations uh, on which they were based. <coughs> The challenge lies uh, in understanding how this intensification of contacts developed uh, during those four centuries, meanwhile the formation of the Kiwitates and the emergence of cities. So this study is uh, made technically possible by combining archaeological records about ancient simulations of finds and spatial and mathematical modeling. This work is carried out at different scale from uh, local to supra-regional level, and across four countries, so France, Germany, Switzerland, and the Zone in Czech Republic. It's also carried out in relation uh, to the SAM, a French lab which works on applied mathematics, and in particular applied to uh, social science. So, 
uh, this work is uh, still in progress. So um, I'm going to present an example of what uh, we can do and what I'm trying to do um, for specific questions on the supra-regional scale. Let's start by a simple remark, first developed by uh, Tim Evans, uh, Ray Rivers and Carl Naffet, that uh, the character and the importance of uh, human sites don't slowly derive from local factors and then all its interactions with all the communities follow on from that. But on the contrary, uh, the number and the extent of interactions themselves may have significantly contributed to the emergence and the prosperity of some agglomerations. In a strictly economic point of view, an advantageous location um, may have largely favored the development of certain sites. We mostly could think about sites situated at a confluence of rivers or at an important crossroads. Um, for example, uh, the site of Wal, which is uh, located um, um, at the crossroads between the roads coming from the, the Rhone and, um, and the Seoul River uh, to the Loire River. So, this economic factor could have been important even if, of course, it's not the only one. We have an opposite example with Bipat, uh, which, is, uh, which was a strong uh, economic and political center but located just in the middle of nowhere. Well, <laughs> for people who come often to be quite, you know what is in the middle of nowhere. Um, so now, if we want to go further and overcome the individual places, we, uh, we have to ask the question in a more comprehensive way. To what extent uh, an advantageous location inside the exchange networks may have been a factor in the development uh, and the prosperity of certain agglomerations. This question calls a systemic answer, that is to say, a work uh, to work on a larger scale uh, with an overall processing, where localized phenomena may have had influences on other parts of the network, and thus allows us to work on the spread of influences. For that, we have several tools um, der derived from uh, two different schools. And the first one is uh, network analysis. Uh, it's uh, firstly derived from uh, the graph theory and it uh, was at the beginning mostly used in mathematics and it's, it's now largely applied <coughs> in social science and in particular sociology and history and for archaeology for the, the, the last decade. And the second one is uh, spatial analysis of networks. So it's a more theoretical modeling uh, developed by uh, geographers and uh, physicists. And for this example, I'll mostly use the second one because um, it's more adapted for economic and geographical issues uh, and about the question I'm asking just for this organization. So, um, my question is, to what extent the economic variable is relevant to explain the development of some agglomerations? Uh, the aim of uh, this modeling is strictly that, to test a variable. It's definitely not a descriptive presentation, uh, but a logical construction uh, carried out a priori that we then compare uh, to real and complex data. So, in this case, um, I worked from inventory of uh, group settlements of uh, East Central Goals. Uh, goal. um, so, I have 320 um, group settlements dated from uh, the Latin B2 to Latin D2 during the fourth uh, last centuries BC. And with uh, all the sites, I will have uh, first to build a network of sites and then estimate the relative importance of each site given by the topography of the network. So, uh, the network takes into account two parameters. Uh, the first one is the uh, hierarchical rank of uh, the site, and it's often uh, considered from its size or its political status. And the second one is uh, the distance between them. So here, the distance should be a bit more complex than the simple distance as the crow flies. I worked uh, specifically on uh, trade flows, so how heavy and cumbersome goods are dispatched um, inside this, like, this large region, and how the settlements derive benefits from it. So for this network, the criteria which uh, the criterion which moves sites further or further away is considered as uh, the cost of transportations. 
We then consider three types of transportation. The first one is by roads, and then there is upriver and downriver. Those three ways implies different speeds and costs than the real uh, geographical distance. Thus, two sites are considered as closer if they are linked by a navigable river. The question of the navigability of rivers and, uh, at that period was also studied. By combining uh, data from archaeology of rivers, geomorpho uh, geomorphology, history, and history of technology. So I have no <coughs> time to explain all of it, so I go directly to this map, uh, which uh, presents both minimal and maximal navigation points at, uh, of the main rivers. As for the road travels, uh, they are still calculated, and uh, they are still for the moment uh, calculated on, pro on the crow lines. So I currently uh, try to add, uh, to add a totalitarian model um, to the network, but it's uh, still in progress work. Um, so from this network, uh, we try to estimate which sites were particularly favored by the location over the, set over the other settlements. So I choose to use a spatial interaction model as the, the gravity models, for example, but applied to networks. It works to model the distribution of flows inside the network. The aim is um, um, the aim is to estimate the attractivity of a place, its possibility for attracting flows from its location in the network. So I'll try to explain it uh, simply. Imagine a small mountainous region with five sites. Four are located in four different valleys, and the fifth is in a plane uh, linking the four valleys. You don't need specific tools uh, to think that the central settlement, the one uh, in the plane, is particularly well uh, located. Because it's linked to everyone else, and where, wherever you are, uh, and wherever you need to go, uh, you have to go through it. So this statement, you are able to make it with the naked eyes. But when the network implies much more settlements, and when the topography is much more complicated than just valleys and plains, uh, then you need a tool. But the model will do exactly the same as what you've done uh, by just seeing the small network. It deploys flows. So I hope uh, this uh, everything uh, is clear. So let's talk about the first uh, outputs. So I started uh, just an example of, uh, of uh, outputs for the Latin D1D period. So I started uh, with um, so Latin D1D around 100 BC. So, I had uh, 130 sites dated from uh, that period, and about 20 stand out to be particularly advantaged by the network. So, uh, sorry, the, the biggest lines shouldn't be so dark, it's a problem, but I hope you can read it uh, at least uh, a bit. So, what can we see? Um, without surprise, the biggest flow, uh, flows follow the main rivers because the cost of transportation is lower uh, than the land travel. Another obvious thing is, uh, well, the very important here of, uh, importance of the, the Paris Basin. So uh, it's definitely not to say that Paris is uh, the center of everything. It's just uh, that uh, it's a bit over, um, overestimated in the model. Um, because sites um, from the, the Parisian So, the biggest uh, red grounds. Um, um, so, the, 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 the sites uh, that stand out in this part of the network uh, are effectively uh, sites uh, known as economically important. Uh, but I think they are a bit over, uh, overestimated mostly because of missing data. Uh, because uh, if you see in the, the previous map, uh, we are missing points between um, the is there a light or something? Okay, you see it. It's okay. So, you, you see that in these parts uh, we have missing signs. So, um, uh, we are missing intermediaries from, uh, from this part of the network to this part. So, uh, that's why the flows go uh, 
west instead, instead of going south. So uh, I have the same problem uh, with the eastern part of the river. Uh, thank you. Better. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, we have uh, the same problem for the east eastern part of the network. Uh, so here, um, for the same problem, um, see here that we have a lot of missing uh, points. Um, so the results here are not particularly efficient. Um, but what we can say uh, is that, firstly, I tried uh, to remove these parts is not efficient part of the network um, where missing data are important. The result was that all these parts of the network, this one, uh, so the Rome and Son uh, Valley, um, practically disappeared from the main flows. We then really see the strong line links uh, between those two regions, um, the one here and the one here. Um, and uh, that the economical importance of uh, the Rhone Sound Valley was strongly uh, related to the fact that it's the way to access the east. As for the main output sites, the model emphasizes uh, emphasize sites that are actually known to be important trade centers. So I don't know if you are familiar with uh, those sites, but uh, you have, uh, for example, Orléans here. Uh, which is now you know, first known uh, to be the political uh, and economical capital of uh, the Vitruvish people. And uh, it's also known by the text to be a place where lived uh, Roman Mechans. Me in the model, uh, it uh, appears here to be um, the intermediary place uh, to go northern from uh, the Loire Valley. So the start, the flows start from here to go here. Um, it's uh, the same thing with the uh, Chalons sur Saône here. Uh, it's one of the two main sites of the Rhone Saône basin in the model, and uh, it's a place where uh, hundreds of uh, thousands of amphorae were discovered next to uh, the ancient port. And Chalons sur Saône is considered to be uh, the ancient port of uh, Vimart. So we can say that the location of all those 20 sites didn't dis disadvantage them to become important trade centers. Um, so that's for the first outputs uh, of the work uh, which is still in progress. So in the following months, I'll, uh, I'll go deeper in this analysis and work on the evolution of this network through time. So I showed you um, a case from, for the Latin D1D, but a diachronical uh, overview would help to perceive the emergence of particularly central places. The second part of the work uh, will be uh, to analyze this network in a more exploratory way. I want to test the importance of certain sites as intermediary in, in the network. Is this sites that are necessary for uh, the su sustainability of the network? For example, you have here this site which is and uh, uh, which is used as an intermediary between this part of the network, so the, the Seine, uh, valley and the, the roads of Valley. Um, so, if I remove Valensursen, if Valensursen uh, doesn't exist, um, what's going on? Does it split the network in two? Does the, the flows continue to, 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 to go from this part to this part? In fact, could the look for a world spread of goods could have been a, a, an essential reason for the emergence of such sites? But before anything else, I I said um, there are still two main problems that have to be solved. The first one is uh, missing data, which is very strong in some parts of the network. And the second one is a uh, problem of uh, road travel, which has to be calculated on a digital terrain model. So that's my work uh, in the next uh, month. Or so. so, as you already see, um, this work is still in progress. In the future, this model has to be more closely confronted with real data about circulations, especially with the spread of Mediterranean imports. It also needs to be reintegrated on a multi-scale analysis, particularly on smaller area, to better understand how interaction between agglomerations and the rural settlements could have been organized. As a conclusion, the networks were the bedrock of the unity of this large cultural complex. 
By studying them and their evolution through time and space, we try to perceive how these human networks set up at the end of the Iron Age. And thus, uh, we try to bring new elements for the uh, understanding of Latinian urbanization processes. And that's the way uh, we try to rethink the Celts. Thank you very much.